Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service here in Calder Church. Um, this service is being recorded as well. We had a slight blip with the first one, so we're having to record this service this morning. It's my great pleasure to welcome once again um, Colin McPhail from Mulgai. Colin was down um, leading our worship on Remembrance Sunday, if you remember as far back as that. And he also gave us um, one online, but it's an absolutely great pleasure, Colin, to have you with us. And I know you're going to be coming for a few weeks between now and the end of, of June. Um, not necessarily all together, but we'll be looking forward to that. So thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, what a beautiful, sunny, sunny, sunny morning, Sunday morning it is this morning. So this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. And as we come before God, let's hear the words of Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are God and that we can come before you meeting together this morning to worship you. And Father, we pray that our worship is acceptable to you. And Father, we also pray that as we hear your word and we hear your word preached this morning, that you will open our hearts and our minds, that we may learn more of you. Father, this morning we bring before you all the folks who will be attending various churches and various places this Sunday morning. And we remember all the folks who can't physically be here with us, but who will be watching this in different places uh, here in this village of Loch Winnick and further afield and uh, maybe in places all around the world. All are welcome before God. We are one church and one people together. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our worship now, and Hannah will lead us in singing at the name of Jesus.
Let us give thanks and pray together for the needs of the world. Let us pray. We thank you for your goodness, your work in our lives, and for your blessings over us. Thank you that you're able to bring hope through even the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purposes. We know you're always with us and will never leave us. We remember your incredible sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough for who you are, for all that you do and all that you've given. You know the times we've been ungrateful or unkind towards others. You know when we complain and grumble about life and its circumstances, but you love us regardless and we thank you for your unconditional and everlasting love. We continue to give thanks for the progress that we as a nation are making in overcoming this virus that we are living with in our lives today. More and more of us are being vaccinated and although some may experience side effects, we give thanks for the scientists and all those involved in the distribution and the vaccination process. This gives us hope for the future. Father, you know our hearts and you share our sorrows. We pray for the work and service of all hospitals, hospices and care homes, for the care, dedication and commitment of the staff, and also for those carers who look after family and friends in their own homes. Surround the frightened with your tenderness, give strength to those in pain, hold the weak in your arms and give hope and patience to those who are recovering. We bring to you the many charity organisations who raise money and provide supportive services to help both here and across the world. We remember all who are finding their life painful, lonely or uncertain, and especially those who are ill or vulnerable. Help them to send your comfort in times of need. We pray for all those who are struggling. Bring them hope to an end of their sufferings and a resolution to their difficulties. Show us the best way to help those who suffer, without being intrusive, but without simply turning away from their pain. As we remember now in this time of silence, all those in our hearts who are suffering or grieving today, we remember too our royal family who mourn the loss of Prince Philip. Be with all who mourn or suffer today. We thank you for our communi community here in our village. We ask you to help us to continue to follow the commandment of our loving our neighbour as ourselves and ask that we may show a sign of the love of God to all that we meet today and during this coming week. Make us more sensitive to others' needs. Sometimes we hear the words that they speak but fail to grasp their meaning. Help us to hear the worry hidden in a throwaway remark or the fear wrapped up in a joke. Help us to identify the cry for help so casually expressed. Help us to listen more and to think before we speak and then to listen again. We give thanks for your church and for all your faithful people here in Lochranach. We pray for our vacancy committee as they seek your will in finding a new minister for us. And we give thanks for all those who have led our worship, keeping our services alive both online and in our church when we are able to worship together. We pray for your church so that each of us might make use of our individual talents, enabling each church group to flourish as a witness to the one body of the church. Help us all to spread the warmth of your love to everyone we meet and help us to welcome all who come here, no matter what their background, outlook on life or outward appearance. And we particularly pray for all those who contribute to the life of our church and your wider church. Help us to appreciate the roles of each other. Lord, we pray for all those who work for peace and unity, for all world leaders that they continue to seek for an end to the suffering caused by war and violence, injustice and inequality, disease, prejudice, poverty and hopelessness, and bring healing to the world. We pray especially for those fighting terrorism and we continue to remember those who are refugees and seek safety in another country despite the dangers of the journey. Look with mercy on those who are fleeing from danger, homelessness and hunger. 
bring those who work with them relief and inspire general generosity and compassion in all our hearts we pray for ourselves as we go from this church today to start the week ahead and we ask that in all we do may we walk more closely with you at our side accept our prayers today for the sake of your son our savior jesus christ amen i would say chatting earlier on with, with some folks and I was saying how much I had enjoyed and appreciated the Lent reflections that you had in, during, during Holy Week. And I was also saying how much I'd enjoyed last Sunday's service, watching that uh, online when Alec Bedford was here conducting the, the service. But what I was also saying was how difficult and stressful all these things can be for the people that are taking part and also for those who are doing all the, the technical aspect of things. It's not always plain sailing with all of that. And I suspect there's sometimes a sense of relief that after the Easter services are over, there's a sense of, well, thank goodness that's all done. We can get back to our normal routine now. Sometimes this church seems to uh, do Christmas and then we take down the Christmas tree and the decorations and we say, well, what's next? It will be Easter. And then once Easter's done, we've eaten all our chocolate Easter eggs. That's it over until the summer holidays. And then it's autumn. And then before you know where you are, you're back to the run into Christmas again. Now, it's obviously not as simple as that, but for many folks, they'll know the Christmas story and they'll know the Easter story, but Luke, the man who wrote Luke's gospel and the book of Acts, he helps us to fit it all together. He tells us the joined up story. He tells us basically what happened next. So you can get this image of the stone is rolled away, we have the resurrection, and for some people there's a feeling, well, that's Easter over and done with. But we need to know what happens next because it's a vital part of the whole big picture of God's plan for us. And we need to know that whole story because in this crazy mixed up world, where all the old ways seem to be getting swept away day by day, where the old standards of behavior, of morality, of the way that we would have expected people to behave and react, when all these things are changing so fast, we need to know what we believe, we need to know why we believe it, and we need to know how to explain it to other people. And that's why over the the coming Sundays when I'm going to be here, I thought we would take a look at the book of Acts and we're going to begin with that this morning. So who was Luke? Well, he was a Greek medical doctor who lived in the city of Antioch, as far as we know. And we know he was very well educated, very well traveled, and a gifted writer. He writes in a style that has been easy for folks to read through all the generations. He was the only non-Jew to write any part of the New Testament. And his two books, that is the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, account for more than a quarter of the total writings in the New Testament. And he was a close friend of the Apostle Paul. He traveled with Paul, accompanied him on some of his missionary journeys, and he's able to give an eyewitness first-hand account of some of the events that he experienced and they're recorded in the book of Acts. And Luke also spent two years in Jerusalem and the surrounding area meeting up with all the main witnesses to Jesus' birth, his ministry, his miracles, his persecution, his trial, his death, and his resurrection. And Luke was there about 30 years after the three years of Christ's earthly ministry. And Luke faithfully recorded 
all this historical evidence that he gathered from the different folk who would have seen for themselves the miracles and the events of Christ's ministry. So Luke was investigating what had happened 30 years previously in Jerusalem. And for some of us, 30 years will be a lifetime away. And I can see a couple of folk, but it's probably more than a lifetime away. But for some of us, we, we can look back and we can remember what happened 30 years ago. And with a wee bit of prompting, we, we can remember main family events or things that perhaps happened in the village here or, or things that happened further afield around the world. And things like maybe someone will tell you the name of uh, a shop before it changed its name to Spa or a shop that used to be there that's really not a shop anymore. There's always people around that we can go to and speak to that can give us that first-hand evidence of how things were 30 years ago. So uh, to me, 30 years ago doesn't seem that long ago. 30 years ago, the Berlin Wall came down, the Gulf War began. John Major, remember him, was Prime Minister. Freddie Mercury of Queen died from AIDS. And my favourite one now, Mark Hately scored two goals for Rangers to win the league in the last day of the season. My point is that Luke was listening to the folk that were there when all these real life events happened in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. And if the folks there could give them accurate memories of that, then we can rely upon that account that we read in the Gospel of Luke and also in this book of Acts. And particularly, we can rely upon the events of that first Easter in Jerusalem. But back briefly to Dr. Luke. Um, he wrote his Gospel in the book of Acts for his friend Theophilus. And Theophilus is Greek for friend of God. And I believe there was a real Theophilus. Apparently he was a high-ranking local official and he was well known to Dr. Luke. But it's convenient that his name translates as friend of God because we are friends of God. And really this book, the gospel in the book of Acts was written as much for us today as it has been for anybody else. So he wrote both books around 60 to 64 AD. He was a historian. He recorded things very precisely and accurately. He was also a diplomat. He was a peacekeeper within the church and a peacemaker. Any disputes or difficulties, Luke tended to have a hand in smoothing things over and, and sorting them out. And he was also an advocate for Christianity with the local officials some of whom would have been very familiar with this emerging new religion of Christianity. Others wouldn't have been, but he would go and talk with them and advocate for this new faith. He was also an evangelist and a theologian. He doesn't only record events, he explains events. And because he does that, we're able to learn so much from his straightforward writings that is of direct use to us today. So Luke's gospel ends with the resurrection and he picks up in the opening chapter of Acts by summarizing some of these things. And that's what we are going to look at briefly this morning. But now Julie's gonna come and read that opening passage from Acts for us. Jesus taken up into heaven. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. 
Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Thank you, Julie. Um, in these opening verses from the book of Acts, look, he brings us up to speed with what he'd said in the closing chapter of his gospel. And he gives us a, a summary of the most important bits, and he points us forward to what happens next. And it's the what happened next that we are just going to begin to unravel and look at this morning. Just as the birth of Christ at Christmas is not the beginning of God's plan, the resurrection at Easter is not the end. But it did bring in what we talk of now as the church age, the age that we live in now and that our successors will live in until Christ returns in all his glory to restore all things when there'll be a new earth under new heavens, the new Jerusalem. So for a moment, let's go back to the beginning. Uh, God made the world perfect and complete. We read of the Garden of Eden in Genesis. But we also read in Genesis of the disobedience of Adam and Eve, sin coming into the world, their expulsion from the Garden of Eden. And that was the beginning of a progressive destruction of all that was perfect. But the turning point was the resurrection of Christ. This is the beginning of all things being restored. This is the beginning of the journey to the new Jerusalem. And what we need to focus on is the resurrection and see it as the beginning of all things being restored. And in this church age, we as the church, we who are the body of Christ, we who are his hands and feet on earth, his servants are called to work with and for him because he, Christ, is head of the church. Our job is to play a full and active part in that restoration of all that God created. Now, my apologies to the folks like Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion, Friends of the Earth, and all the other campaigners of the moment, but this process of restoration can only be achieved by God. Yes, we can do our bit to reduce carbon emissions or slow down climate change or save the polar bears or whatever we are told the latest good cause is, but we cannot save the planet. And yes, God gave us stewardship of the world, and we must endeavor to care for all of God's creation. But, and this is what the politicians and the campaigners don't get, it's the sin nature of humanity, the greed, the carelessness, the selfishness, the pride, the desire for power and control that are the real problems of the world. And this is the devastation that we see in our world today. 
Sin in all its shapes and forms is simply disobedience to God. It's going against God's ways and only a return to God will result in the restoration that so many folk are seeking but can't seem to find. They seek restoration of the planet as a place, but the heart of restoration is not restoring just the planet. It's about restoring the people. The key is restoring the relationship between God and humanity so that once again, all of creation will be at peace. It will be ordered, valued, loved, cherished, and respected. And that is the purpose and the hope of the resurrection. And it can only be achieved through Christ and his church. Now, we we talk about going to church and we talk about the church as a building, and that is true, but we also must understand that we are the church seven days a week, 24 hours a day, united as children of God, called as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, who we accept as our Savior and Lord. We're called to stand together in unity, building one another up in faith, caring for one another, learning from one another, praying together, sharing together, as God's plan is fulfilled through his church, and we are that church, locally here, nationally, and throughout the world. So as we look at the book of Acts, it will remind us that this is no small commitment. This business of working with and through Christ as head of the church to restore and renew is no small commitment in our part. It's a big deal. In fact, it's the biggest deal ever, never more so than in the times that we live in right now. But Luke provides us not only with the reason for being the church, but he he gives us a model for how to be the church. We're not just left to work it out for ourselves. God enables us, and Luke sets it all out in the next chapter of the book of Acts that I hope we'll look at next week. But for now, let's look at the opening verses uh, that Julie read for us earlier. There were 40 days from the resurrection to what we call the ascension, 40 days during which Christ appeared to the women near the tomb. He appeared to Mary Magdalene, to Joanna, to Mary, the mother of James, and and to other women there. And he appeared to the two men on the road to Emmaus. And the two men were just full of everything that had been happening in Jerusalem. This was the biggest event for a very long time, if not the biggest event ever in Jerusalem and the surrounding area. They They had experienced the three years of Christ's ministry, And they had experienced the first Easter and all the traumatic events surrounding that. So Jesus walks along beside them on the road. And Jesus kind of pretends he doesn't really know what's been going on. And these two men say, where have you been? Have you not heard about all the amazing things that have been happening here? And the two men begin to tell Jesus all about these events without, at that time, realizing who he was. And then he appeared to his disciples, and the disciples were hiding away behind locked doors for fear of the consequences of what had been happening. And he appeared to Doubting Thomas. We all know the story of Doubting Thomas. Until I see the marks and feel them for myself, I will not believe. But Thomas did believe. And then he appeared to the disciples again by Lake Galilee as they were fishing. This was a miraculous catch of fish, a huge catch of fish. And it was a a miracle and a sign of the power and authority of Christ. So Jesus was on the, the shore and the fishing boat came in. They brought the fish ashore and the disciples and Jesus ate together. And then Jesus took Peter to one side. 
This is the Peter that three times had denied knowing or following Jesus. And now Jesus asks Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And Peter replies, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, Peter, feed my sheep. And this is restoration. This is another chance, a turning back of forgiveness. And I kind of have that sense sometimes with maybe old and Peter. And I think these words are as much for us as they were for Peter. You're forgiven, come back. Maybe in the past, we've not spoken up for our Lord and Savior. Maybe we've been a bit embarrassed or a bit shy or felt a bit awkward. And in that sense, we've been a Peter, maybe a bit fearful. But at other times, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have stood up and spoken about our own faith, our faith in Christ. But this Peter, this Peter that Jesus said to feed my sheep, he will go on to preach with such power and authority at Pentecost. And we'll hear more of that next Sunday. This was the Peter who was trusted to build the church, to feed the sheep, to look after all the people who were the first Christians. And we'll go on to read about this, as I say, next Sunday when we move on to the next chapter in Acts. But Jesus also appeared to another 500 people during that 40-day period. And after the 40 days comes what we call the ascension. Jesus going up ascending, returning to heaven. So this is the ascension account. Jesus went with his disciples from Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem, on the road towards Bethany, the Bethany road. And that road passed close to the garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, where on the night of his betrayal and arrest, Jesus had prayed for his disciples And he prayed to his heavenly father. And they continued along that road from Jerusalem towards Bethany until they came to the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives is a holy mountain and it's referred to frequently in the Old Testament. And according to the prophet Zechariah, this was the place where the dead will rise first when the Messiah returns. So it has that special significance. And also, it was on the Mount of Olives that Jesus had previously spoken to his disciples of the end times and his promised return. So on the Mount of Olives, Jesus stands before them, before his disciples, and he tells them of the coming of the promised Holy Spirit. And he commissions them to be his witnesses to all people in all the world. And this commissioning of his disciples is the same commission that Jesus gives to us. Just as he commissions us today to be his witnesses, to be his servants, and to be his church. And then as he was taken up before their very eyes, a cloud hid him from their sight. And two angels appeared to the disciples and said the words that I think should be of great hope and comfort to us. The angels said, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And this is the promise. Christ will return in all his glory to complete the restoration of all things that he has begun. You see, the the ascension signaled the end of Christ's physical, earthly ministry. All had been completed. He was the means of restoration, and by his word, by his example, by his crucifixion and resurrection, his job on earth was done. He returned to heaven to sit by the right hand of God the Father. This Jesus, who ascended to sit by his Father in heaven, 
was the son who was man on earth, but we are turned to be with his heavenly father as God the son. And this Jesus, this God the son, returned to prepare a place for us. You see, when we pass from this earth, our spirit will rest with him in heaven until the day of the resurrection of all who have died in faith. And then when that day, that great day of resurrection comes, we will appear before Christ, but we will appear not to be judged because we are safe and we're saved. The promise of scripture has been honored and will be fulfilled. And Christ returned to heaven to become our great high priest, the mediator of this new covenant, uniting us once again with God the Father, interceding for us with no need of any earthly priests. Jesus hears our prayers and carries them to God the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the great Trinity God, three in one. And all of this happened on the 40th day. And then we jump on 10 days to the coming of the promised Holy Spirit at Pentecost, God's gift to us the church. But more on this as we look at that next week. But we end now with a warning and a plea. The great restoration, the great loving promises of Christ's return is for all of those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved from eternal separation from God. And nothing, no matter how bad it is in this world, will be a patch on the suffering of those who will not share in the great restoration. Those who will continue to be separated from God. But those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord will be part of this new earth under new heavens when Christ returns in the same way that he ascended to heaven. So my prayer is that we will share the good news of Christ with family, with friends, with neighbors, with colleagues, and that we will live out that good news in our own lives each day. And Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. As Christians, we have the power of the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit will give each of us the, the courage, the words and the opportunities to share the good news of the gospel, the good news of restoration as we trust in Jesus, the loving restorer of all that is good. The resurrection was not the end. It was the beginning of the restoration of all things to come. And now Hannah and Monica will sing for us, by faith we see the hand of God.
As we bring our service to a close, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here with us. And we thank you that we have been able to gather together to worship you this morning. And Father, we pray that as opportunities arise, you will give us the, the words, the courage, the opportunity to share the good news of your promises, of your promised restoration with all those that do not yet know you. So Father, we thank you again for this place. We thank you for all those who have faithfully served your church here. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and remain with us forevermore. Amen.